Thank you for joining us for another episode of Did You Know? Brought to you by Carry Movers Limited, Western Canada's best. Residential, commercial, office, retail, and piano moving company serving your needs locally, long distance, and overseas. You can find Carry Movers at www.karymovers.com or call them at area code 778 9082811 Today's segment we're going to focus on Vancouver, British Columbia. Vancouver is a coastal seaport city in western Canada located in the lower mainland region of British Columbia. As the most populous city in the province, the 2016 census recorded 631,486 people in the city. Up from 603,502 in 2011. The Greater Vancouver area had a population of 2,463,431 in 2016, making it the third largest metropolitan area in Canada. Vancouver has the highest population density in Canada with over 5,400 people per square kilometre, which makes it the fifth most densely populated city with over 250,000 residents in North America. This brings Vancouver in behind only New York City, Guadalajara, San Francisco and Mexico City according to the 2011 census. Vancouver is one of the most ethnically and linguistically diverse cities in Canada, according to that census. 52% of its residents have a first language other than English. 48.9% have neither English nor French as their first language, and approximately 30% of the city's inhabitants are of Chinese heritage. Vancouver is consistently named as one of the top five worldwide cities for livability and quality of life, and the Economist Intelligence Unit acknowledged it as the first city ranked among the top ten of the world's most well-living cities for ten consecutive years. Vancouver has hosted many international conferences and events, including the 1954 Commonwealth Games, UN Habitat One, the World Expo in 1986, the Apex Summit in 1997, the World Police and Fire Games in 1989 and 2009, several matches of the 2015 FIFA Women's World Cup, including the finals at BC Place in downtown Vancouver and the 2010 Winter Olympics and Paralympics, which were held in Vancouver and Whistler, which is a resort community 125 kilometers or 78 miles north of the city. In 1969, Greenpeace was founded in Vancouver. In 2011, the city planned to become the greenest city in the world by 2020. The city became the permanent home to TED conferences in 2014. Vancouverism is used to describe the urban planning design philosophy of Vancouver. Back to one point that we just mentioned, as it is the E of New Year's going from 2019 to 2020, Vancouver has not accomplished its goal of becoming the world's greenest city by 2020. Vancouver was originally named Gastown and began as a settlement which grew around the site of a makeshift tavern on the western edges of Hastings Mill built on July the 1st, 1867 and owned by proprietor Gassy Jack Dayton. The original site is marked by the Gastown Steam Clock, which is there today. Gastown, then formally registered as a town site dubbed Granville Burrard Inlet, the city was renamed Vancouver in 1886 through a deal with the Canadian Pacific Railway. The Canadian Pacific Transcontinental Railway was extended to the city by 1887. The city's large natural seaport on the Pacific Ocean became a vital link in the trade between Asia Pacific, East Asia, Europe and Eastern Canada. As of 2016, Port Metro Vancouver is the fourth largest port by tonnage in the Americas, the busiest and largest in Canada, 
and the most diversified port in North America. While forestry remains one of its largest industries, Vancouver is well known as an urban center surrounded by nature, making tourism its second largest industry. Major film production studios in Vancouver and nearby Burnaby and Langley turned Greater Vancouver and nearby areas into one of the largest film production centers in North America, earning it the nickname Hollywood North. The city takes its name from Captain George Vancouver, who explored the inner harbor of Burrard Inlet in 1792 and gave various places British names. The family name Vancouver itself originates from the Dutch Van Coeverden, denoting somebody from the city of Coeverden, Netherlands. The explorer's ancestors came from, to England from Coeverden, which is the origin of the name that eventually became Vancouver. Archaeological records indicate that the Aboriginal people were already living in Vancouver area from 8 to 10,000 years ago. The city is located in the traditional and presently unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam and Burrard peoples of the Coast Salish group. They had villages in various parts of present-day Vancouver, such as Stanley Park, False Creek, Kitsilano, Point Grey, and near the mouth of the Fraser River. Europeans became acquainted with the area of the future Vancouver when Jose Maria Nervez of Spain explored the coast of present-day Point Grey and parts of the Broad Inlet in 1791 although one author contends that Francis Drake may have visited the area as early as 1579. The explorer and Northwest Company trader Simon Fraser and his crew became the first known Europeans to set foot on the site of the present-day city. In 1808, they traveled from the east down the Fraser River, perhaps as far as Point Grey. The Fraser Gold Rush of 1858 brought over 25,000 men, mainly from California to nearby New Westminster, founded February the 14th of 1859 on the Fraser River, on their way to the Fraser Canyon, bypassing what would become Vancouver. Vancouver is among British Columbia's youngest cities. The first European settlement in what is now Vancouver, was not until 1862 at McCleary's Farm on the Fraser River, just east of the ancient village of Musqueam, in what is now known as Marpole. A sawmill established at Moodyville, now the city of North Vancouver, in 1863 began the city's long relationship with logging. It was quickly followed by mills owned by Captain Edward Stamp on the south shore of the inlet. Stamp, who had begun logging in the Port Alberni area, first attempted to run a mill at Brockton Point, but difficult currents and reefs forced the relocation of the operation in 1867 to a point near the foot of Denlevy Street. This mill, known as the Hastings Mill, became the nucleus around which Vancouver formed. The mill's central role in the city wand after the arrival of the Canadian Pacific Railway in the 1880s. It nevertheless remained important to the local economy until it closed in the 1920s. The settlement, which became known as Gastown, quickly grew around the original makeshift tavern established by Gassy Jack Dayton in 1867 on the edge of the Hastings Mill property. In 1870, the colonial government surveyed the settlement and laid out a town site renamed Granville in honour of the then British Secretary of State for the Colonies, Lord Granville. This site, with its natural harbour, was selected in 1884 as the terminus for the Canadian Pacific Railway to the disappointment of Port Moody, New Westminster and Victoria, all of which had vied to become the railhead. A railway was among inducements for British Columbia to join the Confederation in 1871, but the Pacific scandal and arguments over the use of Chinese labor delayed construction until the 1880s.
The city of Vancouver was incorporated on April the 6th, 1886, the same year that the first transcontinental train arrived. CPR President William Van Horn arrived in Port Moody to establish the CPR terminus recommended by John uh, Camby, also known as Henry John Camby, and gave the city its name in honor of George Vancouver. The Great Vancouver Fire on June the 13th, 1886, raised the entire city. The Vancouver Fire Department was established that year and the city quickly rebuilt. Vancouver's population grew from a settlement of 1,000 people in 1881 to over 20,000 by the turn of the century and 100,000 by 1911. Vancouver merchants outfitted uh, prospectors bound for the Klondike Gold Rush in 1898. One of those merchants, Charles Woodward, had opened the first Woodward store at Abbott and Cordova Streets in 1892, and along with Spencer's and the Hudson's Bay Department stores, formed the core of the city's retail sector for decades. The economy of early Vancouver was dominated by large companies such as the CPR, which fueled economic activity and led to the rapid development of the new city. In fact, the CPR was the main real estate owner and housing developer in the city. While some manufacturing did develop, including the establishment of the British Columbia Sugar Refiner, uh, Refinery by Benjamin Tingley Rogers in 1890, Natural resources became the basis for Vancouver's economy. The resources sector was initially based on logging and later on exports moving through the seaport where commercial traffic constituted the largest economic sector in Vancouver by the 1930s. The dominance of the economy by big business was accompanied by an often militant labor movement. The first major sympathy strike was in 1903 when railway employees st struck against the CPR for union recognition. Labour leaders Frank Rogers was killed by the CPR police while picketing at the docks, becoming the movement's first martyr in British Columbia. The rise of industrial tensions throughout the province led to Canada's first general strike in 1918 at the Cumberland coal mines on Vancouver Island. Following a lull in the 1920s, the strike wave peaked in 1935 when unemployed men flooded the city to protest conditions in the relief camps run by the military in remote areas throughout the province. After two tense months of daily and disruptive protesting, the relief camp strikers decided to take their grievances to the federal government and embarked on the On to Ottawa trek, but their protest was put down by force. The workers were arrested near Mission and interned in work camps for the duration of the Depression. Other social movements, such as the first wave feminist moral reform and temperance movements, were also instrumental in Vancouver's development. Mary Ellen Smith, a Vancouver suffragist and prohibitionist, became the first woman elected to a provincial legislature in Canada in 1918. Alcohol prohibition began in the First World War and lasted until 1921 when the provincial government established control over alcohol sales, a practice still in place today. Canada's first drug law came about following an inquiry conducted by the Federal Minister of Labour and future Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King. King was sent to investigate damages Claims resulting from a riot when the Asiatic Exclusion League led a rampage through Chinatown and Japantown. Two of the claimants were opium manufacturers, and after further investigation, King found that white women were reportedly frequenting opium dens, as well as Chinese men. A federal law banning the manufacture, sale, and importation of opium for non-medicinal purposes was soon passed based on these revelations. These riots and the formation of the Asiatic Exclusion League also act as signs of a growing fear and mistrust towards the Japanese living in Vancouver and throughout BC. 
These fears were exacerbated by the attack on Pearl Harbor, leading to the eventual internment or deportation of all Japanese Canadians living in the city and the province. After the war, these Japanese Canadian men and women were not allowed to return to cities like Vancouver, causing areas like the aforementioned Japantown to cease to be ethnically Japanese areas in the communities never revived. Amalgamation with Point Grey and South Vancouver gave the city its final boundaries not long before it became the third largest metropolis in the country. As of January 1st, 1929, the population of the enlarged Vancouver was 228,193. The vegetation in the Vancouver area was originally temperate rainforest consisting of conifers with scattered pockets of maple and alder and large areas of swampland, even in upland areas due to poor drainage. The conifers were a typical coastal British Columbia mix of Douglas fir, western red cedar and western hemlock. The area is thought to have had the largest trees of the species on the British Columbia coast. Only in Elliott Bay, Seattle, did the size of the trees rival those of Burrard Inlet and English Bay. The largest trees in Vancouver's old-growth forest were in the Gastown area, where the first logging occurred, and on the southern slope of False Creek and English Bay, especially around Jericho Beach. The forest in Stanley Park was logged between the 1860s and 1880s, and evidence of old-fashioned logging techniques such as springboard notches can still be seen there. Many plants and trees growing throughout Vancouver and the Lower Mainland were imported from other parts of the continent and from points across the Pacific. Examples include the monkey puzzle tree, the Japanese maple, and various flowering exotics such as magnolias, azaleas, rhododendrons, among others. Some species imported from harsher climates in eastern Canada or Europe have grown to immerse sizes. The native Douglas maple can also attain a tremendous size. Many of the city streets are lined with flowering varieties of Japanese cherry trees donated from the 1930s onwards by Vancouver Cherry Blossoms Festival. Other streets are lined with flowering chestnut, horse chestnut, and other decorative shade trees. Vancouver is one of Canada's warmest cities in the winter. Vancouver's climate is temperate by Canadian standards and is classified as oceanic or marine west coast, which under Copian climate classification system is classified as CFB that borders on a warm summer Mediterranean climate. While during the summer months the inland temperatures are significantly higher, Vancouver has the coolest summer average high of all major Canadian metropolitan areas. The summer months are typically dry, with an average of only one in five days during July and August receiving precipitation. In contrast, there is some precipitation during nearly half of the days from November through March. Vancouver is also one of the wettest Canadian cities. However, precipitation varies throughout the metropolitan area. Annual precipitation, as measured at the Vancouver International Airport, averages at 1,189 millimeters or 46.8 inches compared with 1,588 millimeters or 62.5 inches in the downtown area and 2,044 millimeters or 80.5 inches in North Vancouver. The daily maximum averages 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit in July and August with highs rarely reaching 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit. The highest temperature ever recorded at the airport was 34.4 degrees Celsius or 93.9 Fahrenheit set on July the 30th, 2009, and the highest temperature ever recorded within the city of Vancouver was 35 degrees Celsius or 95.0 degrees Fahrenheit, occurring the first on July 31st, 1965, and again on August the 8th, 1981, and finally on May the 29th, 1983. 
The coldest temperature ever recorded in the city was minus 17.8 degrees Celsius or 0.0 degrees Fahrenheit on January the 14th, 1950, and again on December the 29th, 1968. On average, snow falls on nine days per year, with three days receiving five centimeters or two inches or more. Average yearly snowfall is 38.1 centimeters or 15 inches, but typically does not remain on the ground for very long. Winters in Greater Vancouver are the fourth mildest of Canadian cities after nearby Victoria, Nanaimo, and Duncan, all on Vancouver Island. Vancouver's growing season averages 237 days from March the 18th to November the 10th. Vancouver's 1981 to 2010 USDA plant hardiness zone ranges from 8A to 9A, depending on elevation and approximate proximity to water. As of 2011, Vancouver is the most densely populated city in Canada. Urban planning in Vancouver is characterized by high-rise residential and mixed-use development in urban centers as an alternative to sprawl. As part of the larger Metro Vancouver region, it is influenced by policy direction of livability as illustrated in Metro Vancouver's regional growth strategy. Vancouver has been ranked one of the most livable cities in the world for more than a decade. As of 2019, Vancouver has been ranked as having the third highest quality of living of any city on earth. In contrast, according to Forbes, Vancouver has the fourth most expensive retail real estate market in the world. Vancouver has also been ranked among Canada's most expensive cities in which to live. Sales in February 2016 were 56.3% higher than the 10-year average for the month. Forbes has also ranked Vancouver as the 10th cleanest city in the world. Vancouver's characteristic approach to urban planning originated in the late 1950s when city planners began to encourage the building of high-rise residential towers in Vancouver's West End. Subject to strict requirements for setbacks and open space to protect sight lines and preserve green space, the success of these dense but livable neighborhoods led to the redevelopment of urban industrial sites such as North Falls Creek and Coal Harbor beginning in the late 1980s. The result is a compact urban core that has gained international recognition for its high amenity and livability development. In 2006, the city launched a planning initiative entitled EcoDensity, with the stated goal of exploring ways in which density, design, and land use can contribute to environmentally sustainability, affordability, and livability. The Vancouver Art Gallery is housed downtown in the non-classical former courthouse built in 1906. The courthouse building was designed by Francis Rattenbury, who also designed the British Columbia Parliament buildings and the Empress Hotel in Victoria, and the lavishly decorated second Hotel Vancouver. The 556-room Hotel Vancouver opened in 1939, and the third by that name is across the street with its copper roof. The Gothic-style Christ Church Cathedral across from the hotel opened in 1894 and was declared a heritage building in 1976. There are several modern buildings in the downtown area, including the Harbour Centre, the Vancouver Law Courts, and surrounding plaza known as Robson Square, designed by Arthur Erickson, and the Vancouver Library Square, designed by Moshe Safdie and DA Architects. Reminiscent of the Colosseum in Rome and the recently completed Woodward's Building redevelopment designed by Unric Partners Architects. The original BC Hydro Headquarters Building designed by Rom Tom and Ned Pratt at Nelson and Burrard Street is a modernist high-rise now converted into the electric condominium. Also notable is the concrete waffle of the Macmillan Bloedel Building on the northeast corner of Georgia and Thurlow. A prominent addition to the city's landscape is the giant tent frame Canada Place designed by Zadler Roberts Partnership 
MCMP and GA Architects. The former Canada Pavilion from the 1986 World Exposition, which includes parts of the Convention Centre, the Pan Pacific Hotel and a cruise ship terminal. Two modern buildings that define the southern skyline away from the downtown area are City Hall and the Centennial Pavilion of Vancouver General Hospital, both designed by Townley and Matheson in 1936 and 1958 respectively. A collection of Edwardian buildings in the city's old downtown core were in their day the tallest commercial buildings in the British Empire. These were in succession the Carter Building, 1907, the Sun Tower, 1911, the former two at Camby and Hastings Streets and the latter at Beatty and Pender Streets. The Sun Tower's cupola was finally exceeded as the Empire's tallest commercial building by the elaborate Art Deco Marine Building in the 1920s. The Marine Building is known for its elaborate ceramic tile facings and brass gilt doors and elevators, which make it a favorite location for movie shoots. Topping the list of tallest buildings in Vancouver is the Shangri-La at 201 meters or 659 feet and 62 stories. The second tallest building in Vancouver is the Trump International Hotel and Tower at 188 meters or 617 feet, followed by the private residence at Hotel Georgia at 156 meters or 512 feet. The Hotel Georgia is also another uh, focused episode of Did You Know? Feel free to check it out on YouTube or other streaming services such as Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and other social media and streaming sites. Also to mention, the fourth, fourth tallest is One Wall Center at 150 meters or 490 feet and 48 stories, followed closely by the Shaw Tower at 149 meters or 489 feet. Once again, this has been another episode of Did You Know? Brought to you by Carry Movers Limited, www.karymovers.com. Western Canada's best moving and relocation company, providing local and long distance services to residential, office, commercial, industrial, and piano moves. Video produced and all images courtesy of Propix Canada Media, www.propixcanada.com.